Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the 80th anniversary webinar, webinar on Chiyune Sugihara and Visas for Life. My name is David Green. I'm from Nagoya University, and I'm going to be the host of the webinar today. I'll be the moderator. Uh, so today we are going to hear a lot about Chiyune Sugihara and his achievements during the Holocaust, as well as his legacy. This webinar is being held to commemorate the 80th anniversary of the Visas for Life and the 120th anniversary of his birth, among other activities. To begin, we will hear some opening remarks from Governor Hideaki Omura from Aichi Prefecture. Good evening, everyone. I'm Hideaki Omura, Governor of Aichi Prefecture. It's my great honor to give a speech today at this international webinar hosted by Meijo University. I'm delighted to be able to celebrate the 80th anniversary of the Business for Life issued by Chiyune Sugihara and the 100th anniversary of his birth. Two years ago, in October 2018, the Aichi Prefecture government established Chiyune Sugihara Square Aichi Prefecture Senpo Sugihara Memorial at Zuiryo High School, his alma mater. Professor Inaba from Meiji University supervised the project. At the opening ceremony of the memorial, many attendees here today gave lectures and speeches, all of which were truly impressive. Recently in October, the ambassador of Lithuania visited the memorial and met with students of Zuiryo High School. And last month in November, I had the pleasure of receiving the ambassador of Israel here in Aichi. This way, Suihara's humanitarian action continues to foster goodwill among our countries even today. Researchers on Sugihara are going to make presentations and have discussions today. I hope this webinar will further promote Sugihara's humanitarian legacy and strengthen the bonds of friendship between Aichi and the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you for those words, Governor Omura. Now we will hear some words from various ambassadors to Japan, and we will start with the ambassador from the Embassy of Lithuania, that is Ambassador Gediminas Valvolis. Ambassador, please. Uh... Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Professor Green. Uh, uh, dear uh, Governor Omura, dear colleagues, uh, uh, Ambassador Benari, Ambassador Lepel, Ambassador Milevsky, dear Professor Inaba, uh, other esteemed academicians, um, dear participants, it's my um, pleasure to, and honor to address uh, today's webinar dedicated to Chune Sugihara. Um, 80 years ago, in the uh, summer of dramatic year of 1940, the Japanese consul in Lithuania, Chune Sugihara, took uh, the courageous action to save um, human lives. Uh, as we all know very well, Chune Sugihara issued 2,132 transit visas to Japan uh, for Jewish uh, war refugees, guided only by his uh, personal uh, conscience. Uh, now those visas are universally referred as uh, to as visas for life, as they have saved from Holocaust more than 6,000 uh, Jewish lives. Uh, for us, Lithuanian Sugihara uh, is also uh, also became a kind of witness of the loss of our independence, as he saw the Soviet occupation unfolding uh, in the summer of 1940. Uh, while he was issuing those, those visas for life until he was obliged actually to, by Soviet authorities to close his diplomatic mission and leave the country. 
Um, the memory of Chunya Sugihara is highly respected in Lithuania and his deeds are widely known by people of Lithuania. Uh, there is a street and a park named after Chunya Sugihara in our capital, Vilnius. And uh, the premises of the former Japanese consulate in Kaunas is uh, uh, um, uh, currently hosting a museum called the Chunya Sugihara House. Uh, which is, which is a, used to be a very popular uh, destination for, for uh, Japanese travelers uh, before the corona pandemic and we, we hope will we'll, we'll continue to be an extremely popular destination for Japanese people uh, uh, once the international travel um, um, uh, is, uh, will resume. Uh, the Parliament of Lithuania uh, proclaimed the year of 2020 the year of Chunya Sugihara. And uh, also last October, a statue in memory of Chunya Sugihara was unveiled in Kaunas. Um, and recently, in the month of October, I also had an opportunity to visit uh, the capital city of Aichi Prefecture, Nagoya, uh, where a series of commemorative events dedicated to Chunya Sugihara took place, uh, including a special concert by Nagoya Philharmonic Orchestra. I also paid the uh, tribute to the famous uh, Japanese diplomat by visiting the uh, three Sugihara related schools, Heiva Elementary School, uh, Mizuho Gaoka Junior High and Zuirio High School, where I really witnessed how the memory of Chunya Sugihara is cherished and uh, perpetuated. Um, and today I am uh, very much, very pleased to introduce to the participants um, of this webinar the Japanese edition of a book called uh, uh, The Good, The Bad and The Miserable uh, by a well-known Lithuanian historian, uh, Simona Strelsovas, who is attending uh, today's event. Um, this book in Japanese language translated by Mr. Uh, Toshiaki Akahane from Keio University, who is also present at uh, today's webinar, uh, and published by Akashi Shoten Publishing House, uh, will become available for distribution very, very soon uh, to a large uh, public uh, here in Japan. Uh, so this book uh, by Simona Strelsovas uh, takes us back in time to dramatic years of 1939-1940, when the um, World, War II, World War II broke out in Europe. And at that time, Lithuania accepted uh, many war refugees uh, many of them of, of, of uh, Jewish origin uh, who were escaping uh, danger to their lives in other parts of Europe. And Lithuanian state did all it's possible to assist those refugees. However, in 1940, uh, Lithuania's independence uh, was lost. And it was uh, the time when indeed the Japanese vice consul in Lithuania, Chunya Sugihara, acting in close tandem with Dutch honorary consul Jan Zwartendijk issued those famous visas for life in Kaunas. Uh, and the uh, book of Simonas Strelsovas is, is not just uh, a book about uh, an event of the past. It's not just a historic story. Uh, the author uh, endeavors to bridge in his book the past and the present, Lithuania and Japan. And that is, I think, uh, uh, e e even more important. Uh, than just presenting uh, separate facts. Um, Sugihara's legacy continues to live as a continuing uh, and as a continuing uh, bridge between Lithuania and Japan, and it closely brings together our two nations and helps to build many links of cooperation and friendship. Um, and this um, uh, enticing uh, book, written by a, a well-known Lithuanian author and now published in Japanese language in Japan is one of more example of such outstanding cooperation. And actually it also adds a Lithuanian perspective to, to numerous uh, uh, studies about Chunya Sugihara by, by other international uh, authors. And I'm actually very happy also to show you the, how this book looks like. This is the cover of the book, uh, a cover that uh, we received just today. And, and this is, by the way, the, uh, the original book, how it looks, how it was uh, published in, in Lithuania. Uh, so please uh, enjoy the presentation of the author of this book, Mr. Stralsovas, later today. And uh, uh, I, I, by in my fin final words, I would like really to, to thank all those who uh, 
uh, made this publication of Japanese edition of, of this book uh, possible. Uh, and also I would like to thank uh, Professor Inabe uh, in particular for organizing uh, this, um, this event dedicated to the legacy of Chunya Sugihara uh, and for doing all, all his best in those uneasy, uneasy circumstances for, for, for public events. Uh, well, I think it only proves, this today event only proves that uh, how resilient uh, one can uh, be if uh, he or she has a purpose and, and the purpose of this webinar is, is really uh, very meaningful and very powerful. The purpose is to perpetuate the memory of Chune Sugihara. So um, I wish this event uh, uh, to be uh, a very successful and memorable event and would like to thank all, all the participants. Domo arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much, Ambassador Valvolis, Embassy of Lithuania. We'll next have some words from the Ambassador from the Embassy of Germany, Ina Leppel. If you could unmute your mic, please. Thank you, uh, dear Professor Green, dear Governor Omura, dear Excellencies and colleagues, dear speakers and discussants. As the year 2020 is drawing to a close, it will likely go into history as the year ravaged by the coronavirus. While this is true for Germany in general and the German Foreign Office in particular, it was also a year of remembrance. Because we are looking back to 150 years of history since the establishment of the Federal Foreign Office. And it has become glaringly obvious that during the war, the ministry, like any government institution at the time, was anything but free from blame in the terrible crimes committed by the Nazis. Remembering the history of the ministry to which I have dedicated my professional life, it becomes clear that there is no expiration date to Germany's responsibility to remember and to remind others of the atrocities committed more than 75 years ago. But one cannot remember the Holocaust without also remembering and honoring those who were courageously enough to fight it. June Sugihara is one of the stellar figures in the fight for humanity in the face of unspeakable atrocities. One cannot help but respect and admire his courage and the determination with which he dis disobeyed official instructions in order to save lives. For Sugihara, humanity was the highest command, and for that, he was honored in Yad Vashem as a righteous among the nations. As a diplomat, I find Shuni Sugihara and the five other diplomats honored as righteous among the nations important, if uncomfortable, role models. Diplomacy, after all, in normal circumstances, can only function if diplomats and consular staff obey their instructions, whether they agree with them or not. Shuni Sugihara, who risked his livelihood and maybe even his life, to save the lives of others, stands out because he followed his conscience as a human being and accepted the consequences. In this vein, I would like to thank Professor Inaba for the initiative of this worthwhile webinar, and I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion about a subject which, in the current political climate, has become increasingly topical. Thank you very much. Gozecho arigato zaimas. Thank you very much, Ambassador Leppel. That is Embassy of Germany. Next, we will hear from Ambassador Pavel uh, Milewski from the Embassy of Poland. Ambassador, please. Thank you very much, Professor Green. Minna san konbanwa. My name is Pavel Milewski. I'm the Ambassador of um, Poland, and it is my really great pleasure and honor to uh, attend um, uh, today's um, uh, webinar. Um, I've been here 14 months and I have uh, witnessed uh, how important is the uh, uh, legacy of the Consul Sugihara Chune to, um, uh, to all of the um, uh, Japanese people, but I think that he belongs to all of us. Uh, he's very, very, um, uh, very, he's an he's a international hero. And I um, think that this seminar um, uh, here uh, is a very good symbol that we all, not only diplomats, but all of us, uh, we attach a great importance to 
to, um, uh, to, uh, to his legacy. Uh, indeed, Chune Sugihara occupies a special uh, place in the relations between Poland and um, Japan, uh, which last year we uh, celebrated the 100th anniversary of establishing official diplomatic ties. Uh, and opposing the guidelines of his, of his government, he issued over 6,000 visas for Jewish people fleeing from Europe from the Nazi terror, uh, as it was already mentioned. And among the rescued persons, there were many, many Polish citizens who will never forget what the Japanese consul had done for them. And after they arrived here in Japan, they received help from one of my predecessors, the first ambassador of Poland to Japan, Mr. Tadeusz Romer, uh, as well as uh, his wife, uh, Zofia. Uh, they both organized a special committee which provided assistance for refugees to stay in Japan, and then they helped uh, them to obtain the transit visas to other countries. And in my view, um, uh, as a diplomat, as someone who represents Poland here in Japan, this is one of the most beautiful links in our bilateral relations. Uh, Polish and Japanese diplomats who have contributed to saving their people's lives. Uh, and the heroism of Chuna Sugihara has been widely recognized in Poland and created many new friends and sympathy about um, Japan in my uh, country. And his acts have linked our both countries by even stronger bond based on respect, understanding and shared values, which include, among others, acting for the good of others and uh, loving peace. Uh, the act of Consul Sugihara confirms his strong faith in the above mentioned values at the time when they were simply forgotten by many. Respect for the courage and bravery of others and the memory of heroes are among the common features that bind our nations. In Poland, during more than 100 years of partitions, the First and the Second World War, uh, but also during the communist times, it was forbidden to honor the memory of those who, in human times, took the challenge to behave like humans, saved others, but also those who fought for the independent and free Poland. Taking this occasion, I would like to also to mention to all of you a uh, few uh, uh, Poles who, following the same values as Consul Sugihara did, uh, did not succumb to terror during the World War II and found strength to save the Jewish population from the Nazi genocide and during, during the war times. Among them, I have to mention Irena Sendler, who saved over 2,500 Jewish children from the Warsaw Ghetto by placing them in foster families, orphanages, and monasteries. But other heroes include Zabinski Kapel, who rescued over 300 Jewish people, or Zofia Kosak Szczutska, founder of the council called Zegota, the only government organization in the Nazi-occupied uh, Europe whose task was to organize aid to, uh, to Jews. The heroism of Poles who helped the Jewish population is even greater because it is worth remembering that Poland was the only country in German-occupied Europe where rescuing the Jews was threatened with the immediate death penalty. Uh, the number of Poles who were awarded with this distinguished decoration of the Yad Vashem writers among the nations is extremely high. It's over 6,700 people. And one of those among the writers among the nations is also Consul Sugihara Chune. And I would, like to, I would like to take this opportunity to express my warmest thanks to Sugihara Chune Volunteer Guide Program from major university and especially Professor Chiharu Inaba for organizing this uh, anniversary webinar. And I'm wishing you all having a very good and fruitful discussion and presentation over this, uh, uh, over this international hero, uh, uh, who is the Consul Chune Sugihara. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Milewski. That is the Embassy of Poland. Our fifth and last uh, speaker from the various embassies will be Ambassador Yafa Ben Arif from the Embassy of Israel. Ambassador, please. I'm sorry, you're muted. If you could just unmute your microphone. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. A life of ambassadors that is trying to jump from one place to another and to be in all places at the same time. I apologize for arriving late. Uh, for the opportunity to speak uh, in this uh, important webinar. I must say that um, uh, 
it is it is a very very uh, uh, emotionally uh, strong issue for me personally, uh, being a, a child of a Holocaust survivor. So it's not only an historical lesson that we should teach our children about, but it is also something that I carry in myself as part of me, who I am, as an Israeli and as a Jew. I must say, uh, uh, honoring the speakers uh, uh, before me, that definitely each one of us has their own part of this history. But I must say that only we in Israel are basically sharing the story of the victims. The victims of the Holocaust are six million Jews, six million people who were murdered at the time of the Second World War. And we all know about the Holocaust. People in Japan less know about the Holocaust. And I, I must say that thanks to a brave deed of uh, Chiyone Sugihara, uh, it gives also the Japanese uh, population and society an opportunity to learn about the atrocities of uh, Nazi Germany at the time, the atrocities that were aimed to become a final solution to eradicate the Jewish people. That is something that normally uh, in Japan, so, so far away from Europe, they were not exposed to the, the story. Uh, Chiyone Sugiyara is the only righteous among the nation, uh, one of many uh, uh, diplomats, as, as many as 36 diplomats around the world who actually participate, but mainly in Europe. So it's, it was a very special, special uh, uh, honor uh, to have a Japanese diplomat that went well and beyond his duty to, uh, to have this humanitarian deed without any personal uh, uh, benefits like money or for uh, some other reason. And such a humanitarian de uh, uh, deed was recognized because he was also risking his own life. And these are the two criteria by which he, um, that was created in Israel back in 1953 was making it their mission to not only remember all the six million Jews who were killed, among which were one and a half million uh, children, but also to commemorate and to give honor and respect to the saviors. If you look about countries, mainly Poland, where, which before the, the, the war had uh, about three and a half million people population, three millions of them were butchered during the war. If you look at other countries, even in Lithuania, 90% of the Jewish population, 90% of the Jewish population were killed, were murdered at the time of the Holocaust in Europe. But in our tradition, in the Jewish tradition, saving of one life of one human being is as if you save the whole world. And that is the inscription on the map we honored a righteous among the nation. So definitely for us, Juni Sugiora is a savior, not only because of the visa for life for 2,000 people, because we believe that he saved the whole world if he only had saved one person. And he has saved thousands of Jews as a result of his humanitarian uh, uh, deed. So while respecting that, it gives me the opportunity to with your audience here in Japan, the fact that what the Holocaust means for us, the Jewish people, not only when we remember our death and when we commemorate the, 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 the importance of humanitarian deeds by the righteous among the nation, is that explains our resilience as a nation. After all this persecution, we have decided to protect ourselves. Israel was created back in 1948 the Holocaust was a catalyst that made it finally being after 2,000 years in diaspora. So the Holocaust for us, it's not only a, a black part of our history where we were persecuted, but that is a reason and a key, and it's actually blending the very DNA of the, the, the fabric of our being, of who we are as Jews and Israelis, the DNA of survival, the DNA of knowing that we, the only safe haven we can have is our homeland, the land of Israel. And hence, Israel today is still in this generation, and I'm talking about third and fourth generation, 
are actually blend within, the, the DNA is blend in, in, in all of our descendants in Israel today, that we make sure that the Holocaust will never happen again. And the issue of antisemitism that still exists around the world will be faced with our resilience position. We will protect ourselves as we couldn't do it properly in the past, but we will protect ourselves in the present and in the future against any such uh, a threat or any other threat of persecution against the Jewish people, wherever those uh, threaters or you know terrorists are, if it's a political terrorism or it's a state-to-state -to -to -state, uh, terrorism that we see in our region. It might be too strong a message, but I think what we learn from it, and I'm about to conclude, what we learn from it is the fact that we need to educate our generation and the generation to come to respect the others, to give space to others to be different than ourselves, to understand that it's easy to hate Jews because it was done in the past. But once you finish hating the Jews, you start hating other people who are different than you. So education of the lessons from the Holocaust should be learned in any country, in any society, in any community, because it's for the benefit of future generation to come. And I wish you a great success in this webinar. I think you are touching upon a very important uh, subject. And I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, the memory of Chiyone Segiara will be blessed for him, for his family, and for next generation in Japan to come to appreciate the values that he was carrying out. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Ambassador Ben-Ari, uh, Embassy of Israel. And thank you to all of the ambassadors for their words today. From here, we will move on to some of the academic presentations. Before we get to that, just a word to the presenters. Uh, we'll have 20 minutes for your presentations. At the two minute remaining mark, I will chime in if necessary. But to begin, we will start with Dr. Simonas Stretslovas from the, uh, he's the chief researcher of the Sugihara House in Kaunas and his uh, presentation is titled, The Role of Lithuania in Sugihara's Rescue Story in 1939 to 1940. Dr. Stretslovas, please. Thank you very much. Um, at first I would like to check, can you, can you see my slide? Can you see? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors, Your Excellency Governor, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. It's a big honor to participate in this webinar. I truly believe that our discussion is more than commemorative speeches. There is a good chance it could be as part of global rethinking to avoid mistakes that were happened many years ago to avoid mistakes in future. I'm glad that despite this year's pandemic, we can connect and see each other. And for audience around the globe, especially students, is a superb opportunity to get some fresh ideas and probably rethink events that happened 80 years ago. Recently, I was thinking what would happen if refugees back in 1939 had an internet or could use Zoom as we today? What if they could show the world what is happening in Poland being occupied by Nazis and Soviets? Would it change anything? And honestly, I could not find a positive answer. I'm afraid nothing would be changed because today refugees have cell phones some of them have internet, but the world is tired of daily refugees news, and we still have millions of suffering people. Very similar as in 1939, because not the internet, not communication, and not specific circumstances show the right answer. The right answer is within us. We have it inside, and it depends on our level of empathy. Can we still be empathic? If the answer is yes, 
we can solve refugee and similar problems. Back in 1939, in Poland lived 3 million Jews. After September, they found themselves trapped in Nazi and Soviet-occupied territories. Minimal number of them were lucky enough to escape and found refuge in Lithuanian Republic, 14,000. So small number and so many lives. Lithuanian Republic in 1939 was in a very difficult situation. After restoration of the state in 1918, Lithuania had fought with Bolsheviks and Poland. The war with Poland had a huge impact for both states. Neighbors and possible geopolitical allies had no diplomatic relation until 1938. And here we had 1939. In September, there were no enemies anymore. There were left those who needed help and those who could help. When Poland was occupied, thousands of its citizens, Poles, Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Jews were seeking safe shelter for themselves and their children. It was time when their safety, their lives, and fate were at stake. At that time, great powers of free world had two options, help or close their eyes. But we know already what had happened at the Evian Conference in 1938, selfish passivity. You know, when we have the opportunity to help today, but instead we choose not to, day after tomorrow, we will pay triple price for our passivity. And the world had paid enormous price for its mistakes in 1938-1939. In 1939, thousands of Poland's citizens found refuge in Lithuania. Refugee. By this word, we usually mean poor people trying to escape violence and brutality of war. And it is correct. However, a huge job involving thousands of employees had to be done to guarantee this safety for refugees. Finances, logistic, administrative decisions, and diplomacy. Everything works in one direction to guarantee the safety. It was a big task, a challenge for a small country like Lithuania to guarantee safety for refugees. In autumn of 1939, in every Lithuanian town bordering with Germany or Soviet Union, there were refugee registration offices. After crossing the border, refugees were registered and after primary documentation, the Jewish organizations of Lithuanian Red Cross took care of them. People received documents issued by British legation in Kaunas or refugee certificates issued by Lithuanian state. Despite the price was minimal, some refugees had not enough money to pay for refugee certificate. In this case, they got the documents free of charge. Jewish yeshivas in Mir, Grodno, Pinsk, where world famous and Jewish youth from all over the world used to come study there. Suddenly, because of deadly danger from the Soviets, these students had to retreat. In Lithuania, there were no restrictions to proceed the religious life. There were no single cases anti-Semitic or anti-refugee violation registered in Lithuania. Let me shortly introduce the situation that Lithuania was in 1939. The main seaport Lithuania in Lithuania, Klaipeda, was annexed by Germany in March 1939. Of course, it had a negative influence for trade and country's economy. By the end of 1939, 35,000 Polish civil citizens, 14,000 soldiers were registered in Lithuania. They needed food, medical care, warm houses for coming winter. Because of geopolitical situation, the war, annexed seaport, 
huge refugee number in Lithuania, and the state uh, faced financial challenge. It wasn't crisis though, as we say today, every seven or 10 years, but it was challenge. It was a difficult time. Therefore, the Lithuanian government adopted gentleman agreement with international refugee relief organizations and the British Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Lithuania undertook to allocate 30 and later 50 percent from national budget to the amount received from abroad. The work of aiding the refugees was assigned to the board of the Lithuanian Red Cross Society. The board was tasked with coordinating all activities related to the refugees, collecting donations for refugees, relations with organizations providing aid to refugees, monthly estimates to aid expenses, identify regular food portion, medical care, monitor to aid work, carry out any other work related to aiding the refugees. With financial support of Lithuanian state and foreign organizations, the Committee to Aid Jews was set up in Vilnius. The committee took care of nutrition, clothing, housing, child care, medical care. Similar situation was with Polish refugees. It's very important to notice that Japanese diplomat, Chuina Sugihara, witnessed a refugee arrival to Lithuania since the very first day. He saw everything, I'm sure, that autumn 1939 was among the main reasons that helped Sugihara to make decision and direct actions to help those refugees. Now, I would like to show you this map again and have a couple comments about it. We have to focus our attention on re Jewish refugees. As I've mentioned before, 14,000 Jewish refugees were in Lithuania. But I guess it would be a mistake to think that they had plans to settle here for a long time. I think Lithuania was hardly seen by the Jewish refugees as a permanent home. It was more treated as a safe transit stop until there was a chance to move to their desired destination. Whether South America, South Africa, Palestine or United States. With the help of this map, it becomes clear that it was practically impossible for Jews to leave Lithuania bypassing the German occupied territories of Poland, Germany itself, or the rest of Europe. Before the spring 1940, the Northern Road, Northern Road was available crossing Scandinavian countries. But during the Winter War, aggression of Soviet Union against Finland, Sweden faced complaints from Soviets as some refugees joined Finns in fighting against Soviets. After short negotiation, Sweden stopped issuing visas to former Polish citizens and the route had to be abandoned. The other way to get to a free world for Jewish refugees was by transit through the territory of the Soviet Union. The official goal of most Jews was to reach Palestine. In the Lithuanian Republic, Jewish refugees might plan their journey for months. They needed time to collect money and receive additional documents as visas. After long negotiations between Lithuanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the highest Soviet officials, finally in April 1940, the Soviets agreed to let refugees, only Jews, to use Soviet territory as a transit to Odessa at the Black Sea port. Refugees were supposed to continue the journey passing Turkey to Palestine. Unfortunately for refugees, this agreement between Lithuania and Soviet Union short-lived. By the end of spring 1940, most of European states were divided between two brutal German and Soviet regimes. In, in, and in June, Lithuanian Republic was occupied by Soviet. Suddenly, Jewish refugees had no place, no place left to hide. The escape roads to free world were closed, or at least it seemed so. Lucky for refugees, the decision to let refugees pass Soviet territory was made in April. 
Chunya Sugihara during his last weeks in Lithuania issued more than 2,000 transit visas, those opening the borders for refugees and saving most of them from inevitable death. At this time, there were some road changes introduced. Instead of reaching Odessa, refugees had to use a long road, Kaunas, Moscow, Vladivostok, Suruga. To achieve real freedom, Jewish refugees had to travel thousands of miles by Trans-Siberian Railway and cross the sea before they finally reached the shores of Japan. It was a long journey, however, it led to freedom. Thanks to visas issued by Chunya Sugihara, thousands of people have been saved. The role of Lithuania in the rescue story, it's not easy to evaluate it. In the historical rescue narrative, it is underestimated and left in the margins. But we know already that the rescue story was not five, six weeks long. Instead of it, it lasted from September 1939 to spring 1941. Usually, our judgment is based on final result. But it is only part of the picture. Because if we concentrate our attention to safety of refugees in 1941 as a final result, we will understand that achieve this result, everyone had to play their part since September 1939. And despite the fact that Lithuania was counting its last months of statehood, it played its exceptionally significant role very well. The world is very different from 1939-1940 today. And yet, very similar. We still have witnessing wars and refugees. But on the other hand, we have examples like this rescue story that show that empathy and willingness to help can always overcome even the greatest challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Strelzovas. We will move next to the second presenter, that is Professor Rotem Kovner from Haifa University. His presentation is titled Yad Vashem and the decision to recognize Sugihara as a righteous among the nations. Professor Kovner, please. His Excellency, the Governor of Aichi Prefecture, dear ambassadors, friends and colleagues. It is good to see you all at this difficult time and discuss the merits of a unique person. Before starting, I would like to thank Professor Rinaba Chiharu for organizing this webinar and for his many other activities with this regard. At present, the Japanese diplomat Sugihara Chiyune is widely recognized as a paragon of virtue and humane benevolence. In his own country, a number of museums are devoted to his memory, and his name is mentioned in virtually every school textbook on modern history, let alone Japanese history, published in the past decade. Sugiara has been the protagonist of numerous doc documentaries, TV programs, a play and, a, and an opera, and eventually and even a full-length feature film. Currently, his newfound fame is so widespread that a recent public poll conducted in Tokyo with regard to great figures in Japanese history crowned him as the greatest of all time. Incredibly, as late as 1990, and exactly half a century after his visa issuing took place, Sugiyar was still a completely unknown figure, both at home and abroad. For me as an historian, the winding road of this belated transnational commemoration is interesting and telling as the events in Kaunas in 1940. As you all know, issues of memory and commemoration occupy a major part in the study of history today. Cultural heroes are an important part of our collective memory, but at the same time, heroes are the product of an era they live and the choice of who becomes a hero is not arbitrary. In this presentation, I argue that the involvement of Yad Vashem was a major element in the early recognition of Sugihara. It is likely that without Yad Vashem, we would not convene today to discuss this act of heroism. 
That said, the recognition was gradual and associated with certain difficulties that require elaboration. One may argue that Sugiara and the act he is associated with have moved during the last eight years through four stages of public recognition. Sugiara began with anonymity, then moved to exposure, then to recognition, and finally to fame. The first turning, turning point in, in Sugiara's commemoration, and that is the move from anonymity to exposure, occurred in 1968. That year, Joshua Nishri, the new economic attaché in the Israeli embassy in Tokyo, was able to locate Sugihara after years of search. In 1940, Nishri, by then Orlansky, that was his name, was one of those who left Kaunas with a transfer visa issued by Sugihara. The emotional reunion that followed led to first exposure of Sugihara in the Japanese press. Moved by the story and attentive to Sugihara's modest request, the Israeli ambassador arranged a scholarship for his youngest son, Nobuki, to study in Jerusalem. The embassy was also prompted the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs to send a letter about Sugihara to Yad Vashem with the ambassador's own recommendation attached. Established, established by the State of Israel in 1953, Yad Vashem, which means a monument and a name, is Israel's official memorial to the victims of the Holocaust. One of the core goals stated in the charter of this institution at the time of its establishment was the honoring of non-Jews who risked their life and liberty to save Jews during the Holocaust. Nonetheless, it took another decade before a commission was charged with the duty of awarding the honorary title Righteous Among the Nation to pertinent rescuers. In 1968, and upon checking the documents relevant to Sugiara, Yad Vashem decided his case did not meet his, its criteria. We do not have documents about this decision, but apparently it was due to doubts about whether the Japanese diplomat had risked his life in the course of carrying out his life-saving activities. This decision notwithstanding, Sugiara called Yad Vashem in late 1968 while visiting his son en route to Moscow. In the wake of his visit, Sugiara received his first exposure in the Israeli press, but like in Japan, no further articles appeared for some 15 years about his case. In 1983, the name of Sugiara was sent again to Yad Vashem. This time, the concerted support of several Israeli individuals and official organizations was effective. During its meeting on October 4th, 1984, the Yad Vashem's Commission for the Designation of the Righteous determined, though not unanimously, that Sugihara met the necessary criteria and thus resolved to award him the title the right of Righteous Among the Nation. The committee referred to his action as one that had served, saved Jews from the Holocaust and the Germans, and this view has persisted ever since. The award ceremony for Sugiya was held in Tokyo three months later, and although it was covered by only a few newspapers, both in Japan and Israel, this was the beginning of a new stage in the commemoration of Sugihara. In fact, Sugiara moved at that stage in 1985 from a mere exposure to recognition. It was not only in the wake of his rec this recognition, it was only in, this, in the wake of this recognition that Shino Teruhisa's important book, Yaksoku no Kuni e no, tabi, no Nagai Tabi, was written in 1988. And without this recognition, I believe neither Sugiara Yukiko would write her book, Roxani no Inochi no Biza, two years later nor the town of Yaotsu would venture into the commemoration of Sugiara with a memorial park and a museum. Still, what were, the, what were the background and motives for the change in Yad Vashem's attitude? To understand this, we need to explore further the place of Yad Vashem in Israel's view of the Holocaust. 
Although Israel did not exist when the drama in Kaunas took place, since its establishment in 1984 and 1948, it has considered itself responsible for Jewish faith and memory. Yad Vashem and its projects of commemorating rescue of Jews during the Holocaust were pivotal to these nation, national claims. In Israel's memory project, the Japanese consul was merely one of many who were honored for saving Jews. As of, as of uh, 2020, this year, the state of Israel through Yad Vashem has honored no fewer than 27,712 people with their title of righteous among the nation, and the number is still growing. Most of these people, more than 6,000 in Poland and almost 1,000 in, in uh, Lithuania, among other places, risked their lives and some even died during their activity, but only a small number of them have gained fame beyond the confines of Yad Vashem's recognition. The consideration that led to Sugihara's initial recognition provides some clues to his subsequent commemoration in Israel. Back in 1983, when the Israeli embassy in Tokyo urged a re-examination of the Sugihara case, his recognition seemed to offer a rare opportunity. The pretext for the embassy message was the impending broadcast of a documentary about Sugihara on one of Japan's major TV channels. Nonetheless, the paramount motive of those who promoted him in Tokyo was to ameliorate Israel's public image, and by extension also to improve its poor diplomatic relation with Japan. At the time, Israel's image was at the one of its lowest point in Japan. Deteriorating since 1967, Six Days War, this image was solid further in, in 1982 due to Israel's invasion to, of Lebanon and its alleged involvement in the Sabra and Shatila massacre. In the diplomatic terms too, Japan ties with Israel were reduced to a little more than symbolic in the, way of the, in the wake of the 1973 OPEC oil crisis. Thus, the embassy in Tokyo wanted to use Sugiara to show other fac facets of Israel, as one of the ambassador at the time told me later. As a state agency, Yad Vashem was eager to cooperate. In fact, since the rise of a right-wing government in 1977, Israel had been witnessing increasing politicization of the Holocaust. Diplomats who helped Jews during the Holocaust were received now greater attention, although they had been considered quintessential figures in Yad Vashem pivotal projects of honoring righteous Gentiles since its start. Unlike ordinary righteous individuals who acted on their own, the recognition of diplomats also entails the recognition of their countries by the state of Israel. For some countries, and particularly for those whose wartime record of humanitarian, of, uh, of helping Jews is questionable, the official recognition seemed particularly attractive. Nevertheless, very few diplomats did risk their life to save Jews during the Holocaust, making it difficult to meet the stringent criteria Yad Vashem established in the early 1960s. Attractive politically, the case of Sugiara underscored this dilemma acutely. That is, how to honor a diplomat who did not risk his life. Indeed, the final deliberation about him in the Committee for the Righteous Among the Nation in 1984 was highly charged because a few committee members find it difficult to reconcile the fact that Sugiya did not risk his life by issuing visas and even enjoy diplomatic immunity at that time. The insistence of the chair of committee of the committee, the Polish-born Supreme Court Justice Moshe Beisky, was crucial. Surviving the Holocaust with the help of Oskar Schindler, Beisky was extremely enthusiastic, as one member of the committee testified, about the specific story and asked the member to interpret the condition of risk more broadly, especially in the view of the large number of visas issued. 
although Sigiar was not approved unanimously, he was recognized at last at that meeting, whereas 16 years earlier, his case had not even reached the committee. His recognition allowed Israel to bestow an official honor upon Japan for, for the wartime deed of one of its representatives in attempt to break some 11 years of stalemate in the di diplomatic relations. Specifically for Yad Vashem, Sugiya offered an additional bonus. However rare, as a non-European and ostensibly non-Christian savior of Jews, in fact, and unknowingly to the committee, he was Orthodox Christian, Sugiya was a powerful testament of the universal character of humane benevolence as exemplified by the concept of the righteous among the nations. Israel hopes for substantial improvement in the, in the diplomatic relation with Japan did not materialize immediately, although not because of Sugihara. Despite the ceremonies in his honor in Tokyo, Japan's reluctance to improve the bilateral relations was the outcome of realpolitik. But time was on Israel's side. In the late 1980s, the bilateral trade began to soar. Uh, the final turning point occurred in the wake of the Gulf War, as Japan realized that the Arab boycott, which had always made it hesitant to do business with Israel, was waning. With this changing circumstances, and regardless of the initial political consideration that underlay his recognition, Sugiya became a, a well-known and highly appreciated figure in Israel. It is hardly surprising then that when Prime Minister Koizumi Junichiro came to Israel in 2006, he was taken to visit Yad Vashem and the tree planted in Sugiya's honor. This ritual was repeated during Prime Minister Abe Shinzo's visit in 2015 and with any other Japanese dignitary visiting the country. In, Israel, in recent years, Israeli dignitaries, several Israeli dignitaries have often reciprocated by visiting sites commemorating Sugiya during their official visit in Japan. By the same token, the Israeli ambassador takes part in this event, uh, does it as did earlier ambassadors. They may have thought, as some confided me in the past, that the memory of, of the Holocaust in Japan is too much associated with Sugiyara and that there are other aspects that require awareness. Still, due to Yad Vashem recognition, the memory of Sugiyara has become not only a major aspect of Israeli-Japanese relations, but also embodies for both countries a moral pillar, pillar that goes, so it seems, beyond mere utilitarian motives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kovner. Uh, we will move next to our third academic presentation. This is Professor Chiharu Inaba from Meijo University. His presentation is titled, Jewish Refugees Severe Escape from Lithuania to Japan in 1940 to 1941. Professor Inaba, please. Yes, thanks for all the governors and ambassadors. Thanks for giving greetings to this webinar. And all the participants and the <coughs> discussant to attend here to giving a presentation comments. Thanks a lot. And all the listeners, of this webinar, also to listen to our uh, new researchers about Chuna uh, Sugihara here. Yes, in my presentation, at first, I would like to see the no, 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 not this one. Yes, it's, uh, this is a uh, it's a Chune Sugihara uh, <coughs> Square Sample Sugihara Memorial. This is uh, established by Mr. Omura Hideaki, Governor of Aichi Prefecture. Uh, 
in October 1918. Oh, nice, nice, very nice park. And in the Ah, okay, okay, never mind. It's, it's, <clears throat> and it's, uh, it was uh, front of the Zuiryo High School. It's uh, f fair, Fitch Sugihara graduated more than 100 years ago. I am as uh, Associate Professor David Green, today's moderator and chair, advise uh, contents of Sugihara story at the park. And I'm now also organizing a Sugihara volunteer guide program at the park. So today I, sorry, today I, uh, yes, uh, today I talk about two conditions for rescue in re refugees in general. They need the one, it's a permission. For example, entrance or transit visas. And the other, they need uh, money for accommodation, food and transportation. In 1940 in Lithuania, it was the same thing that Jewish refugees needed transit visas and money for leaving Lithuania and the Soviet Union fit annex Lithuania in August 1940. By Dr. Streltsovas, Professor Rutkowska and Russian scholars researchers, Jewish refugees in Lithuania it's uh, all, uh, almost 2,200, 300s came to Japan. It's uh, there, 500 or 600 were rich bourgeois, and 1,500 to 1,700 was religious yeshiva rabbis. Ut like to leave Lithuania, not because of the Holocaust, because it's uh, in 1940 there was not Holocaust yet in Lithuania, but because of Stalinism, which regarded capitalists as the enemy of communism, and uh, Stalinism prohibited the freedom of religion. So today I'd like to talk about the monetary side of Sugihara's rescue story. Yes. It's coming now, yes. Yes, this is a Sugihara's refugee list. Sugihara was sent to Japan in February 1941. In this list, there are 2,140 names of list. It's, uh, it means that it's uh, Sugihara issued uh, Japanese transit visas for 2140. Uh, actually, it's a Sugihara issued more visas, maybe 2500 or 600, I'm not sure, but it's uh, more than 2140. But it's uh, here is the uh, only one Oh, sorry. Ah, back, back. Oh, not back. H how to return? Ah. Sorry. Yeah, here is uh, only one American name. 
he has only one American name. It's uh, issued in, on 17th of August, 1940. His name is uh, Moses Beckerman. And he, uh, it's, uh, he paid 10 liters to Sugihara. As a, as a, all, all of the physique paid only two liters, but he paid 10 liters. So it means Moses Beckerman was not the refugee. He's a special person. So it's now I will explain uh, who is Moses Beckerman. He was a social worker from New York City and dispatched to Vilnius in 1939 as a representative of the JDC. This JDC is a Joint Distribution Committee, New York. This organization supported funds for Jews all over the world. Today also, it's a, he's a, it's a representative and it's a, in, <coughs> You see, it's uh, Beckerman surely met Sugihara in Kaunas before he uh, Sugihara issued visas in the end of July. And maybe he had promised preparing the deposits for each refugee. See, it's a, uh, and uh, I, I will explain that a uh, bit about the Japanese conditions for issuing transit visas in the case of Japanese embassy in Berlin in 1940. It's, it's a Japanese embassy asked each Jews to show visas for his or her final destination. In this case, in the Berlin, most of them chose the final destination as a Shanghai. And each have to show $100 deposit towards the destination. This $100 is a US $100, not other currency. So, uh, then they can get a visa. Maybe Sugihara said to each Jews all the sa uh, same things in Kaunas. And one more thing, monetary affairs, when refugees departed from Lithuania to Bradyostok, the Soviets asked each refugee to pay 100 US dollar as a ticket fee. But please remember, it's a communist regime. It's uh, their money, their currency. It, it, it's, uh, uh, they came from Poland. Maybe they had a Polish Zoti currency, but all the Polish currency become uh, just a paper. And the Lithuanian money, Litas, maybe only limited amount can be exchanged to uh, <coughs> Russian ruble. So they didn't, most of them didn't have money. But anyhow, it's a uh, Nine ninety-seven thousand dollars was spent for Yeshibot people as a transportation from Lithuania to Bradyostok. So they or somebody have to pay this money, and. It's a, please remember that there is a rich Jews, 5,500 to, 500 to 600. They probably, they paid 
their travel expense by themselves. But religious yeshiva, they are maybe not rich, maybe poor. They are 1,500 to 1,700. They couldn't pay the ticket fee by themselves. So, and uh, Beckerman departed from Lithuania to Japan in February 1941. That's uh, probably with the final group of Yesibot. And uh, surely that uh, money, it's a Beckerman, not only Beckerman, but uh, the JDC paid. And this uh, groups, final groups, uh, uh, 15,500, uh, 1,700 arrived in Kobe. And uh, Beckerman also came to Kobe in March 1941. And Beckerman surprised that there are 1,700 refugees stayed in Kobe and 130 refugees stranded in Bradystock. Uh, why? Because of the lack of travel expense to Japan. And uh, Beckerman finally solves a strand in Russia. It means that uh, Beckerman uh, sent a fee, uh, sent a money to Russia. And he departed to Shanghai in the middle of April to negotiate for accepting uh, refugees in Shanghai. There are still uh, th th uh, more than 1,000 refugees is stranded in Shanghai, it's, uh, but uh, they have to leave to Japan, uh, uh, from Japan to somewhere. And, but it's uh, East Jukon is uh, uh, it's, uh, in Shanghai, Jewish organization said that they would accept the Beckerman proposal if the JDC would pay living expense for refugees. But unfortunately, JDC New York was seriously short of funds. So it's uh, they. Uh, the Shanghai Jewish community refused to accept the Jewish refugees. But uh, anyhow, it's uh, Beckerman had to depart to South America in autumn 1941. So after this, I will say that in July 1941, Japanese invasion of South France in uh, Indocina. Then it's uh, August 1941. The United States that embargo on export of petroleum against Japan. This embargo means that it's uh, uh, any money would not come to Japan anymore. So the Jewish community in Kobe couldn't help the refugees anymore. So it's a uh, Jewish refugees in Kobe was very short of money. But it's uh, Japanese regarded those refugees as somewhat like uh, it's uh, Soviet agents and they don't want to keep them in Japan anymore. So Japanese government deported 900 stranded Jewish refugees to Shanghai. And in December, Japanese surprise attack on the Pearl Harbor and all the JDC support towards even Shanghai is stopped. So after the Pacific War, the refugees emigrated to the United States, Canada, Australia, Palestine, and others. That is a, a historic story. And here, please see the JDC expenditure in 1940. 
it's a, it's a, based on the JDC annual report in 1940. It's a total expenditure of JDC in 1940 is uh, uh, 6.3 million dollars. And please see that it's uh, here is uh, Poland is the biggest amount, but Lithuania it's a uh, six, <coughs> $605,000, third biggest amount to pay to Lithuania. And please see that it's a uh, one US dollar in 1941 was today's almost $40 compared with the uh, Japanese price. So, J uh, but it's, uh, please remember, JDC income 1940 is a uh, little bit less than $6 million. So, it's a JDC's balance. It's a uh, $350,000 deficit. Uh, today is it's a forty million dollars deficit. So um, it's uh, in nineteen forty thirteen thousand five hundred Jewish refugees in Lithuania, based on the Strelzovas research, and uh, this means that the, each refugee in Lithuania received forty five dollars. But it's uh, almost two million Jews in the German Poland in 1940, but uh, each Jews in Poland received just 40 cents. It's uh, Jewish refugees in Lithuania received 100 times a bigger amount than it's a state in, uh, it's a, uh, 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 Jews stayed in Poland. And also, Beckerman pre, uh, prepared $100 for each refugee who uh, traveled from Lithuania to Vladivostok in 1940 to 1941. And uh, it's a total travel expense sh should be more than $15,000. And in Kobe, more than 1,300 refugees stranded in March 1941. There are 1,700 refugees stayed in Kobe, but it's uh, maybe 400 left to United States, Canada, or somewhere. Uh, and it's a daily allowance for each refugee in Kobe what is a 1.2 yen. It's today's or, or almost like a thousand yen. It's a, the, at that time it's a 30 cents. But one month's allowance for 1,300 refugees is, uh, uh, it's uh, $11,000. And the Jewish community in Kobe and the religious community in Yokohama asked minimum $4,000 to JDC. But JDC New York answered that, oh, it is very difficult to pay. And even $2,000 a month. But anyhow, how, uh, uh, however, JDC pays some fat money. But uh, please remember that without Beckerman's no uh, JDC's help, refugees in Lithuania couldn't come to and stay in Japan. And those 90% of Jews who could not come to Japan and stayed in Lithuania were perished by the Nazis immediately after the outbreak of the German-Soviet war in July 1941. So it's a, a, 
Beckerman, the JDC help is uh, uh, very important. It's the uh, same importance as as Sugihara or more importance be because of the money. Uh, that is the very important thing and sorry and last it's uh, i want to explain uh, it's uh, for japanese audience the japanese audience didn't understand a lot our why that uh, the jdc support only the religious jews it's uh, the jdc's fund were limited basically the relatives or any supporters of the uh, them had to show the deposit to the JDC. Then it was able to remit the fund to the relatives of the ESC, but overseas. So anybody has to pay their fund. And Zionists in, in America would like to cultivate future religious leaders for the new Jewish state in Israel. For example, all the 300 yeshivot and rabbis of the Mil Yeshiva survived, which is now leading the Orthodox Judaism in the United States and Israel. Yes, it's, uh, this is my presentation. Thanks for your listening. Thank you very much, Professor Inaba. We will move now to some discussion from some invited guests. And we have three discussants today with us. We will start with Professor Toshiake Akahane from Keio University. Professor Akahane. Uh, I'm a translator of Mr. Sretsova's book into Japanese. It was a great honor to engage in translating this book. The translation will come out around mid-December in Japan. I'm sorry to say this is a mock-up or just a book cover. Please wait a, a little until the translation is available at bookstores. Uh, first, I'd like to make it clear that I don't specialize in history. I have not been trained as a historian, but I like reading history books, mainly of Japan and the Western world. So today I'm talking about this book, not as a historian, but as an amateur of history. Uh, some parts of his book remind me of a detective story. Of course, he usually bases his study on the rigid facts, but in some cases, as he confesses, because of various causes, there are not enough archival data nor historical records to prove and support his consideration. In such cases, he uses his ability as a storyteller, I think. I felt as if he enjoyed writing these reasonings. I heard he likes literature and he was even working on a novel. I'm not entitled to treat this book as a historian, but I think this book includes what exceeds a history book. And I'm interested in the use of comparisons, metaphors, and images in this book. What is the most impressive for me is that he compares Lithuania with the miserable and forlorn Jewish refugees. He argues as follows, quote, the country that accepted the refugees was left to deal with its problems alone, abandoned to its fate. In essence, it was equated to the same refugees whose fate was overlooked by everyone." Unquote. Uh, Lithuania is an independent state, while Jewish refugees are people. It is true that the two are in different categories, but Mr. Sretsovas tried to treat the two in the same plane. As a result, I was able to realize the troubles and the loneliness, not only of Jewish refugees, but of Lithuania as a state. And some quotations from the film of Casablanca produced in 1942 in the US are put at the top of each section. 
these quotations are related with the fact that Lithuanian, uh, Lithuanian historians refer to Kaunas in 1939 as Casablanca. Depending on how much you are familiar with the movie Casablanca, you can enjoy, uh, you can understand the message Mr. Sobas contains between the lines in this book. I hope you are looking forward to the release of this translation sooner or later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Akahane. For our second discussant, we will jump over to Berlin, Germany with Professor Gerhard Krebs at Free University Berlin. Professor Krebs? Yes, to you. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Do you hear me? We okay. Can hear you. Well, I came, I came across Sugihara's activities during my decade long studies on Japanese German relations during the Nazi period. But surprisingly, in surviving German documents, Sugihara is not mentioned in connection with his, Jew, with his pro Jewish activities at all. Uh, at that time, uh, Germany was still interested in getting rid of the Jews, to expel them to other countries so that anti-Semitism would rise in the, other, in the new host countries. But Sugihara is mentioned in German documents because of his spy activities. He was not sent to Europe uh, to rescue the Jews, but to spy against the Soviet Union and against Germany. And that's why the Germans hated him. Uh, because of his spy activities in Lithuania and later in Königsberg in the newly founded Consulate General. Uh, nowadays, it's uh, Kaliningrad, Russian Kaliningrad. Um, Sugihara spied uh, uh, because Japan was interested in the military build-up of the German Wehrmacht against the Soviet Union, preparing the war starting in uh, June uh, 1941. And uh, Sugihara reported from the uh, military build-up to his home office. Uh, later, uh, he was uh, expelled from uh, Germany and uh, went to Romania. Uh, so uh, his pro-Jewish activities don't show up in German documents. But I want to stress that it was a German journalist who was the first one, as far as I know, who took up the Sugihara story. Uh, his name was Gerhard Dammann. He was a German TV correspondent in Tokyo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Krebs. And for our third and final discussant today, we will jump over now to Poland, uh, Warsaw University, with Professor Ewa Pawasz Rutkowska. Professor Rut uh, Pawasz Rutkowska, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, it's okay. Okay. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I'd like to add something uh, from Polish side. And uh, I wonder, but I uh, would like to say something more <laughs> about uh, this connection with uh, Sugihara and Poles. And uh, first of all, um, I am extremely happy that Sugihara Tune and his humanitarian activities during the war are being so popularized in Japan, also as a result of major university activity. Thanks to this, uh, Sugihara is recognized in his homeland, and I hope that he will remain a part of both individual memory and collective memory, especially as many young people uh, are taking, uh, taking part in this process. The past that is preserved in individual and collective memories is not only an element of contemporary social consciousness, but is also an important factor in creating local and national identity. Moreover, it plays an important role in the upbringing of the young generation and in fostering their civic attitudes and pro-social behavior. 
when almost 30 years ago, I, in the beginning of 1990s, I began my research on the cooperation of Sugihara with Pose, there was almost no one in my cycle in Japan, both among non-academics and academics, who would have known who Sugihara was, despite the fact that Yad Vashem honored Sugihara a few years earlier. Also, already in 1990, Sugihara Yukiko, whom I met in 1993, had published her book Rokusen Nin in Ochino Visa. And a year later, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Japan, who fired Sugihara after the war, officially rehabilitated them, uh, him. Soon after that, the Hill of Humanity Park was established in Yaotsu, uh, where in uh, 2000 the Sugihara Chune Memorial Hall was opened. In the same year, a commemorative plaque with the inscription, I quote, in honor of Mr. Chiune Sugihara, a courteous uh, diplomat of humanity, was unveiled in diplomatic archive of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Tokyo. I think that the process of preserving the memory of Sugihara has expanded in the 21st uh, century. century. We have new museums, uh, films, monuments, uh, books, uh, TV programs, musicals, etc., etc. One of the uh, events that without doubt has also contributed to that process was the unveiling of Sugihara Monument. Uh, Professor Sugihara, uh, sorry, Inaba uh, told us about that, uh, in front of um, the school he attended, the uh, Zuiryo High School in Nagoya. I was, uh, I was honored to take part in this event and together with Professor Rotem Kaufner and the council's descendants, we delivered speeches in front of Zurio High School students. This made a lasting impression on me and I'm sure that the young people listening to us will always remember who, was, uh, who Sugihara was and be aware of the importance of humanitarian efforts in general. For me, Sugihara is also important because of his cooperation with Poles during the war. When the Japanese authorities lost trust in their ally, Germany, after the uh, molotov ribbentrop Pact in August 19, uh, 1939, they decided to create a new mission to observe not only the USSR, but also Germany. And therefore, Sugihara opened a new consulate in Kaunas in November 1939. Years later, in 1960, he explained, I quote, as a consul in, Ka in Kaunas where there was no Japanese colony, I understood that my main task was to inform the general staff of the army and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs about the concentration of German troops near the border, end of quote. Soon, Sugihara established contacts with Polish underground in Lithuania and intelligence of officers from the Polish general staff and among others with Captain uh, Jakubianiec and Lieutenant Dashkiewicz. Jakubianiec was officially assigned as a translator to the Japanese military attaché office in Berlin, while Dashkiewicz accompanied Sugihara in Kaunas. In exchange for information on Germany and the USSR, Sugihara added Polish underground and military uh, intelligence in sending mail from Lithuania to the West to Polish government in exile in London and from the West to Lithuania or even further um, to Warsaw via Japanese diplomatic mail. The cooperation between Sugihara and Poles concerned also visas for life. Uh, visas for Polish Jews, mainly Polish Jews, but also not Jews, Poles not Jews, and members of the military fleeing from Germans and Soviet threat, deportation, or even death. Dashkiewicz claimed that it was the Polish side who had suggested issuing such visas for Poles, including officers, who, with the help of such documents, would leave occupied Poland and Lithuania and form Polish army in exile. As we know, Sugihara decided to issue visas without the approval of the MOFA in Tokyo. In the majority of cases, he issued visas in documents containing annotation by the Jans Wartendijk, the Dutch consul in Kaunas. According to the so-called Sugihara list, he saved uh, two 
1,139 uh, refugees. The actual numbers are, are certainly much higher, as also children excited the country of, on their parents' uh, visas. And uh, with the end of August uh, 1940, when Sugihara had to close the consulate, he issued some documents without successive numbers. There were also forged visas uh, issued after he had left Kaunas on uh, September 1st. Uh, this was possible because in order to facil uh, facilitate uh, his work, Sugihara, as it was suggested to him by Dashkevich, ordered a rubber stamp and a second identical one was created and later used by the Polish underground in Vilnius. Sugihara cooperated with Dashkevich, as you know, Professor Krebs told us, also uh, in Berlin, Prague, and Koenig Königsberg uh, until the second half of 1931. Refugees with Sugihara transit visas traveled via uh, the Trans Siberian Rail Railway to Vladivostok and then took ships to Tsuruga. They were uh, helped by other Japanese, by Nei Saburo, Consul General in Vladivostok, and by Osako Tatsuo from the Japan Tourist Bureau in Tsuruga. After Polish refugees began to reach Japan in mid-August 1940, the ambassador of Poland, Tadeusz Romer, cared after them. Sugihara is extremely important in Poland-Japan relations, mainly because of the courageous act of humanity humanitarianism, but also because of the cooperation with Polish officers. And therefore, Sugihara was twice, uh, twice awarded uh, posthumously by the president of Poland. For the cooperation with the Polish intelligence, he was awarded the Commander Cross of the Order of Merit in 1996, and in 2007, he received the Order of Polonia Restituta, the Commander's Cross with Star for Saving Jews. Thank you very much, Tensa. Thank you very much, Professor Pawasz Rutkowska. So we unfortunately do not have the ability to take questions and answers from the audience at this time. However, if you do have any questions or issues of concern that you would like addressed, there is a contact email address on the webinar webpage. So uh, you can please send any inquiries that way. Just a personal note as well. Uh, I was involved in the translation of the Chiyune Sugihara Park at the Zurio High School, and that was actually the first time that I became aware of Sugihara. Myself, my family uh, were descendants of uh, Polish Jews uh, who left during the Holocaust as also. So there's definitely a personal connection to this, and I think that it's very good to sort of keep that memory alive for Japan. It seems that Japan doesn't have a lot of connections, and so this Sugihara connection is an excellent tool to learn about the Holocaust and what happened during World War II. As a last sort of uh, thing that we're going to do, I would like all of the panelists to turn their cameras back on. I guess we're going to take some photographs for posterity here. So if you could turn your cameras back on, it would be most appreciated. Everybody is present, excellent. So uh, I guess the, the goal here is to wave your hand or something like that. <laughs> and then uh, the, the people here at May, Meijo University are going to uh, take some pictures. So if you could, please. <laughs> okay, I think, they, I think that they've got it, as far as I know, okay. Okay, uh, and that is, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but that is everything for today. So thank you very much everyone for your attendance, uh, wherever you happen to be. And uh, we hope that we can see you again on another one of these events. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Green. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Attendance. <laughs>